Good morning and welcome to Arbor Christian Fellowship. Good to see you all here today. We're going to start out by singing Majesty. I think it might be a good idea to sing that standing up. So let's stand together. pray for a moment, shall we? Thank you, Father, for being with us today as we raise and glorify your name. We pray that our hearts would focus on you as you lead us closer to you in this service today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to sing another one here, Worthy of Worship. Kind of goes on with that idea of lifting up God's name in praise. Worthy of fear, worthy of 
kings and redeemer, wonderful counselor, comforter, friend, savior and source of our life without end. You are worthy, Father. Savior, sustainer, you are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Pastor Danny Daniels, come and share with us. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our services at Arbor Christian Fellowship. It's good to be here. Good to be here with you. So uh, God bless you. And before we continue our worship, I just want to make some pertinent announcements and information uh, coming up. I uh, want to announce that we had a, a first class uh, a women's ladies class this morning. They had a little snack and then the Sunday school class uh, led by Linda Baldwin, and so it was a wonderful turnout and things. So just rejoice in that, and so that'll be continuing uh, with the class. So just a, a real, real blessing. Then I want to announce, if I had a trumpet, I'd blow a trumpet as they made announcements that were big and huge. But uh, next Sunday, October 3, after worship service, there'll be a fellowship barbecue. Now, we haven't had any kind of thing like that in about 19, 20 months since uh, things got shut down March of 2020. And then we reopened up 10 weeks after that and, of course, taken temperatures and spread out and removed rows. And so this will be a wonderful, wonderful time of fellowship uh, next Sunday after church service, worship and barbecue. So it'll be a great, great opportunity for us to get back I'm not going to say get back to the old normal, but get back to a new normal that is wonderful. So I thank you and praise you for all that God is doing and that we're moving on and doing some things. Also, uh, we want to just remember Norma Jean Fish and family. She went home to be with the Lord last Sunday. Her memorial is not this next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after and you'll be getting more information at that at 3 o'clock at Rose uh, Mortuary. So you'll be getting more and more information about that. So it's good to be with you on a little rainy day and, uh, and thanks. Uh, summer's over. Uh, fall is here. Uh, I'm going to ask Allison to come up. Uh, she's part of our church family. And I've asked her to share uh, a brief testimony. She is headed to Africa next week and many of you know her so one of the beautiful things about Arbor Christian Fellowship is we're not only spread out here in California but we also have our hands reaching out to Africa so Allison wants to share uh, just uh, what's, what's going on also we support her we support her so any gift and offering just earmark at Allison or South Africa and it'll get uh, appropriately uh, there we support uh, young people and they're sharing and so Allison you come good morning it's good to see you guys again I am getting ready to leave in just two days I leave Tuesday for South Africa again so I've been home for about two months now and it's been really good to be back and see you guys face to face and um yeah, I've been waiting for my visa. Um, finally came on Friday, so we booked the flight and I'm heading back out. But I just want to share a couple of things um, that we've been doing and are going to continue to do. Um, we've been established now for almost two years. December, it will be two years, um, which is wild. We spent our entire first year in the mess of COVID, so it definitely did not look the way that we thought it was going to look or anticipated um, our first year on the ground building this missions base in South Africa. Um, but God is so good. Um, he's so faithful and um, really has, has been so kind to guide and direct us each step of the way um, to the point where now we've, we're kind of coming out of this lockdown phase 
um, of COVID, things are starting to open up. We're, we're beginning to um, be allowed to gather again. And um, our prayer room, which is the first thing that we worked on, is building this house of prayer for the community of Potch. So anyone from any church um, can come and join us for prayer and worship each day, Monday through Friday. And we were doing these morning prayer sets um, from 6 to 8 a.m., um, so that people could come and pray and worship before they had to go to work or go to go to class. We're in a university town. And um, it was amazing to see people um, outside of our team showing up at 6 o'clock in the morning um, to come and pray with us for, for Pachistrum, for our town, for South Africa, for Africa, and the nations. And um, it got to be so so much that basically as soon as we were allowed to start gathering in there again, the, the space was too small that we had just built. So we're already dreaming and scheming like how we can get into a bigger space or knock walls down um, to make this space bigger because we've had to already um, <laughs> tell people, sorry, <laughs> we're full. You have to come back tomorrow. Um, and, um, and we're like squeezing as many as we can legally in there. Um, so we've already moved, um, in this last month to, uh, I think we're at 18 hours a week. So we still have the morning, um, two hours each morning. And then we've added afternoon times as well so that more people can come and join. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, another thing that we are doing is just last week on Wednesday, we officially kicked off. Um, a oral Bible translation ministry school. So we have about 45 of our staff um, <clears throat> that are doing this school, learning how to help translate the Bible into these languages that don't yet have a Bible yet. Um, so from what I understand, there's, there's at least 30, but I think less than 30 languages in sub-Saharan Africa that still do not have a Bible in their language. And so we believe that no matter how remote the tribe may be or the village may be, every single person on earth deserves to have the written word of God in their language. And so we are running this ministry school to help understand um, and train up young men and women to be able to go into these places and have the tools to translate the Bible into these languages that don't yet have it. So that just kicked off last week. We're super excited about that. Um, we're super passionate about seeing Bibles in every home and in every language on the earth. So that's happening. And then in January, we will kick off um, another discipleship training school. So this year we ran our first one. Uh, January, we're going to run another one. Um, we really feel like this for this second school, that there's a big emphasis on the nations of Africa. So we're going to be kind of honing in on how can we reach um, some of the most unreached places possible in on this continent. Um, so we're really going to put a focus on Africa there. Um, we believe that Africa is meant to reach the nations. I think for, for years and years and years, we've seen Western nations coming to Africa to bring the word of God. And we actually really believe that now is the time for Africa to go that now is a time where we're gonna see African missionaries being sent out more than ever before into the nations, reaching places like America and Europe. Um, so that's something we're really passionate about, really excited about, and um, kind of all of our efforts are, are focused on that within this next year. The Bible, translating the Bible, and empowering and um, encouraging and training up African missionaries to go out into the nations and reach the unreached, reach the lost. Um, <clears throat> another personal thing, which I'll say is my last thing that I'm really excited about, is this earlier this year I did a doula um, certification course, and I did that. I finished the applica uh, sorry application. I finished the admin um, academic portion of it online. Um, and if you don't know what a doula is, it's basically a professional birthing um, coach um, for for mothers, and so where a midwife would do everything that's medical and like deliver the baby. Um, a doula isn't, um, I wouldn't do anything medically per se, but I would um, help uh, laboring mothers to deliver their babies um, and assist them 
in everything physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, involving childbirth and delivery. So I've always been really fascinated in, um, by pregnancy and childbirth. It's something that I've always been really um, just fascinated by and interested in. And I always had this dream to become a doula or do something with midwifery and childbirth, and, but I just never felt like it was the right time. Um, and it never really seemed to fit in with what I was doing in the here and now. So it kind of just felt like, well, you know, God will open the door when it's time. And so about a year ago, um, this October, we were in a prayer set and we were praying um, against abortion in South Africa. It's, it's rampant. I think the last statistic we have is that one in every four pregnancies ends in abortion in that country. And um, there's so many young, young mothers that just are scared. They don't know what to do. They don't have the education. They don't have, you know, the resources and the knowledge to know um, to, to what to do. So there's so many abortions, um, both legal and illegal, that are happening. And we also live in a college town. And so outside of even the poorer communities, you know, you have you have other students that maybe have a drunken night and end up pregnant and don't know what to do, and so then they go and get these abortions. And, um, and so it's something that is, is really rampant, unfortunately, in our town. And so we were praying against this and, and asking the Lord for wisdom, and, and all of a sudden I just felt this, this pop into my heart of the Lord starting to speak to me about becoming a doula. And whereas before it was just this interest that I had, now I felt like the Lord was giving me like a greater purpose other than me just being interested in it, which isn't wrong. Um, but I just felt like the Lord was like, no, I actually want to give this back to you and I want to open the door and allow you space to use this for my glory. And so I went and I did this school online and as soon as I get back, I'm going to start the practical, um, the practical training to get fully certified. Um, but um, we have a midwife on our team who has been dreaming about opening up a birthing center um, in Pachistrum, and it's something that has been on my heart as well. So we're, we're kind of praying together and dreaming about what that could look like, but even just going into um, the poorer communities in and around Poch and offering um, education, offering resources um, and service in that way. Um, and potentially down the road opening up a birth center where we can serve mothers. So um, we want to be able to serve any type of mom, but I think specifically my heart really goes out to, um, to young teen moms and single moms who are kind of doing it on their own as I was raised by a young single teen mom for uh, quite a few years before we found Jim. So... <clears throat> um, so yeah, I just have a huge heart for that. Um, so that's another <clears throat> exciting thing that's kind of still in the dream, dream phase. Um, so we'll see kind of how the Lord leads us in that. But I'm really excited about that as well. So we want to see, um, we want to see our team and our community that's in South Africa really serve um, people in every sphere. And so that's why. We're doing this Bible translation. We have the prayer room. Anyone is allowed to come to those prayer sets, whether they're saved or not. We've seen people who are off, literally off the streets. We found during evangelism, we've said, hey, you want to come and pray and worship with us? They're like, yeah, sure. They show up um, and, and they get saved in this, in this house of prayer. And so it's really beautiful what God is doing, what he's opening up. Uh, we're doing so many things. Um, our team has more than doubled in size in the last three months, which is crazy. Um, we have lots of new interns and new staff that are coming to us, and I just really believe that um, our team doubling in size is, is so symbolic of where the Lord is taking us, and um, he's bringing people in and raising up an army because we need it for where we're headed and um, for, for what is about to happen in South Africa and Africa and in, in the rest of the world. And so I just want to say thank you to you guys for all of your continued support um, and your prayers. And I just love being able to come back here and see you guys again. And I'm always greeted so warmly. And so thank you so much for, for all of your love and your prayers and your support over the last 
now 10 years in missions. <laughs> so thank you guys. I'm not sure when I'll be back, but hopefully it won't be too long. And um, yeah, I just appreciate you guys so much. So thank you. Love you guys. And, and, and the work and the opportunity. Uh, we, we have our heart and a foot in Africa through you here in this little corner of Orange County <laughs> in Yuppieville. But we're touching Africa, so God bless you and, and thank you. Father, I pray for Allison. First of all, I pray for her family. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that they are willing to let go and send her we thank you for the upbringing and the raising. And I pray, God, for the separation anxiety that comes. Lord, I pray that you will open doors and use her. Father, I pray, God, that there'll be travel mercy, travel mercy. Tuesday, we pray for support, and we thank you that our church can do a part in making that happen. I lift up YWAM. I love YWAM so much. That organization is so on fire for you and touches so many places and young people that are part of it. Uh, Lord God, they're the best. And so I just thank you. I thank you. And we just pray travel mercies. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One last thing before you step down. The word doula actually is a biblical word uh, from the word doulos. Uh, when Paul said, I am a doulos of the Lord Jesus Christ, doulos means slave or servant. And so as a doula, you are doing something similar to what Paul did in heart and attitude. God bless you. God bless you, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, just for giving your child to the Lord and the blessing for our church. Thank you, Allison. God bless you. Glancing down at the first line of this song, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, including Africa. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, How majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. Oh Lord, God Almighty. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord. By your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God, O Lord God Almighty. All right, God is mighty. Let's do that. Let's lift up his name a little bit. We're going to sing Days of Elijah. It comes around every eight or ten weeks. We get to sing this one again, and it really gives our heart joy. A lot of words to this one, so you'll have to keep your eyes up there. P. 
These are the These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion Hill, salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel. These are the days of Ezekiel. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. These are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in your world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes. Shining like the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. No one like God. Use the word Jehovah in this verse. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There is 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 no God like Jehovah. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee. And out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Isn't that a great song? It is just a great song. We've had a a guest this morning to speak for us. Now we're going to have a guest come and sing for us. But I have a personal interest in this one. Uh, our granddaughter, who is a student now at Biola College uh, over in La Mirada, is that right, La Mirada? And she's a junior uh, majoring in education. Um, and she is, she's been away from Biola most of the year because of the pandemic and had to do uh, uh, off-campus studies. But this is my granddaughter, Anna, who's going to come and sing for us and bless our hearts. We've heard her practice already. She's got a beautiful voice. She's participated in worship leading at her church up in Eureka on many, many occasions. And uh, it's great to have her, especially great to have her here today. So, Anna, come and sing for us.
Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 57. And I'm preaching part two, a message I began Wednesday night. That was all the introduction. Now I'll fill in all the blanks. Good to see such a great turnout. I mean, each Sunday we're getting more and more. And uh, back March 15, 2020 was our last service before we went into a 10-week, 10 10-Sunday 10 lockdown. And with that lockdown began our video outreach and ministry, ministry broadcasting uh, there, and uh, it's reached a lot of people and things. And so even though the doors were shut, the word still got out. Then 10 Sundays after that, when the President of the United States said, churches are a necessity and they ought to be open next Sunday. Uh, the word was, what is essential and what's not? And he said, the President of the United States said, churches are essential and they must be open next Sunday. Well, uh, sometimes I don't get it and things. So uh, the next Sunday, we were doing same o same o, But uh, as we were beginning the service and ready to broadcast and, and video, record live and things. I inadvertently left the front door accidentally open 
it was totally unintentional. I, 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 I left it open. And all of a sudden, eight or nine, ten people start streaming in. I mean, eight or nine, ten people start coming in. And we had church. We had attendance. And we've been open ever since. And it just seems each Sunday, it's more and more and more and more. And uh, I honor you for what you're doing. And so, you know, I don't give medical advice on the pandemic, nor do I do political commentary. <laughs> All I can say is be careful and be safe and be faithful un unto the Lord. But we're going to take a look uh, this morning, uh, a psalm for a time of lockdown. All right. I'm doing a sermon series called Certainties in Our Time of Uncertainty. Certainties in Our Time of Uncertainty. And we're facing some uncertainties we don't know. Uh, they say one thing, then they say another thing. Do this, don't do that. It's okay. It's safe. No, this. Uh, uh, you know, best thing to do is the trust in the certainty of the Word of God, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His Word changes not. But I'm talking about a psalm, Psalm 57, a psalm for a time of lockdown. When I was growing up as a boy, which was a long time ago, back in the dark ages, <clears throat> before digital, okay, so that'll kind of give you, one of the favorite TV shows in America was a TV show called The Fugitive. The Fugitive. I used to watch it as a boy, loved the show, and the storyline is that they, the role played by David Jansen, Dr. Richard Kimball falsely accused of murdering his wife. And on the train ride over to death row, there's a train accident and Dr. Richard Kimball escapes. He's an innocent man. And then so they had a guy uh, played by Barry Morse, uh, Lieutenant Gerard, who was the man that was gonna hunt the fugitive down. The name of the TV show was The Fugitive. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting to me is how could they keep letting Dr. Uh, Kimball escape out of the clutches every show from Lieutenant Gerard? He, he catches him a bunch of times, but Dr. Kimball escapes. Wouldn't you think after a while they'd replace him with another cop to chase him down? That had to be the most inefficient, you know, frustrated you know, man in the world. I mean, well, I want to talk about another fugitive. Uh, the David Jansen fugitive was all TV, all Hollywood, all make-believe. But there really was once a fugitive, a real fugitive, running and hiding from the death squads of King Saul. His name is David. Yeah, that David. Okay, David of Psalm 23. That David, he had displeased the King Saul when uh, King Saul was told by a prophet that uh, God's going to remove you from your kingship and you're, uh, I'm going to replace you with a young shepherd boy named David. An insignificant shepherd boy, but not insignificant to God. You may feel this past week that your life is insignificant. Maybe you've taken some bumps and grinds, or you've been beat up, or things didn't work out the way you would hope to work, or things seem to be stagnant or, or neutral, and you might even think in your heart and mind, where's God? He's where he always has been, on his throne and looking out for you. You are significant to God. And so this young shepherd boy, David, Saul finds out that he's going to replace him, so what does Saul want to do? I'll kill him. Okay, and he sent out death squads after him. So David's hiding, and the context of Psalm 57 is David hiding in a cave when the death squads are looking for him, all right? Uh, the death squads that we heard about from El Salvador, uh, nothing new, n n nothing new. They had the death squads back here. So with that context back in mind, uh, I'm going to read the 11 verses of Psalm 57. By the way, just a little background on the book of Psalms. What's beautiful about the Bible is that the book of Psalms is dead center in your Bible. If you open up the Bible and crack it open dead center, you're going to hit the Psalms. The very heart, the very heart. 
And Psalms is the book that teaches us how to relate vertically with God. How to relate vertically with God. The next book is the book of Proverbs, which tells us how to relate horizontally with one another. And the reason Psalms is before Proverbs, that before we are right with other people, we first need to be right with God vertically. We see here in Psalm 57 these words of of David, a psalm after he fled from Saul and hiding in a cave. And though he's hiding from Saul, God knows where he is. And no matter what today, God knows where you are. God knows your need. God knows your shape. God knows that tear, that pain, that heartache you might have had this week. He knows and rejoices in the victory. One of the things in life is those kind of things come and go. One day it's wonderful, it's victory, it's praise, it's joy. The next day there's a letter, there's a phone call, there's a situation, and you weep. At least you have emotion, at least you have feeling. And God knows, God knows those feelings. Psalm 57, be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you and in the shadow of your wing I will take refuge that's a beautiful metaphor by the way one thing about a shadow I remember that song by Cat Stevens I'm being followed by a moon shadow moon shadow kind of cool song there one thing about being under a shadow or being in a shadow that when there's a shadow what does that mean there's light above there's light somewhere You can't have a shadow without light. And Christ is our light. He says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. They that walk with me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Light of life. Notice, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until the destruction passes by. David saying, the fugitive. The fugitive, David, not David Jansen from TV, but David from the Bible is saying, this will pass over, and until it passes over, I trust in you. I will cry out to the Most High, verse 2, the God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send forth from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. Focus on those two words, loving kindness and truth. It's it's grace and and truth. Loving kindness is God's grace. This is a special word in the Old Testament. It's the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, hesed. And it's it's a wonderful, beautiful phrase. It's a technical term for God's love. The equivalent is the New Testament word agape, which some of us might be a little more familiar with. But in the Old Testament, it's the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, translated loving kindness. And literally the word hesed means God in the heart, God in the skin. God loves us and knows us so well, he knows what's inside of us. He knows what's under the skin. When we see one another, we don't see what's inside. We might see sparkling eyes and a smile. We might see sadness and a frown. We we might see discomfort. We might see exuberance of, of joy. But God knows what's inside. We live in our skin. The real you and I is inside. And uh, that's God in the skin. And when we talk about God's loving kindness, it is God knowing us what's under the skin, knowing our heart. New Testament translates it grace and truth, grace and truth. Book of John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The first Christmas, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory that was full of grace and truth truth. That's not just New Testament. That's Old Testament. God will send forth his grace and truth. The end of verse 3. My soul is among lions. David uses the metaphor of 
He's going to get chewed up and chopped up by Saul and his hit squad and his goon squad and his death squads. And uh, he just says that uh, he, he, he is in danger. He is in danger. He talks about how their tongues and the, the things that they say against them are like a sharp arrow. Has anybody ever told a lie about you? Has anybody word-wise said ugly things about you? Uh, well, David experienced that. The, the, the teeth and the, and, and the tongue are, are like a sharp sword saying criticism, criticism and, and stuff. Here's the thing I've learned in life. Often the people that do the greatest things and accomplish the most are oftentimes some of the most criticized people often by people that have really done nothing. Leaders criticize. Uh, ball players are, are criticized. There's a guy in the San Francisco Giants named Brandon Belt. He's, he's hitting home runs and tearing up the league like crazy. And by the way, there's a week left of the tight pennant race between the Giants and the Dodgers. And, uh, you know, they always like to pick on that one ball player and criticize him. He just can't seem to do anything right. H have you ever felt like that? You know, just remember, God knows. God looks upon the heart. God looks with his hesed, his loving kindness, under the skin. God knows what's inside. Uh, and then David brings praise uh, against uh, uh, here for God. Praises God in spite of people that are trying to do destruction and distortion of his character. He talks about how... Uh, they prepare a net for my steps. Verse 6, my soul is bowed down. David humbles himself. But look at verse 7 and the rest of the chapter. We see a transition. Uh, actually, verses 1 through 6, David begins with a lament. But he ends in verse 7 through 11 with joy and praise. And oftentimes what begins in our lives with hurt and pain and brokenness, we give it to the Lord. We see it in God's perspective can Turn to joy and praise. Verse 7 through 11, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. Here's a principle of interpretation. I think I've said the last three or four Sundays I preached, yes, I know I'm repeating myself. But I was trained in seminary that you have to say something six times before people hear it. So <laughs> I think this is my fifth time, so maybe next week you'll hear me say it again. Notice Notice, we see here, uh, uh, my heart is steadfast and my heart is steadfast. Verse 7, it's repeated. It's repeated. When the Bible says something in one verse one time, it's important. As we used to say in the 60s, it's heavy, man. It's heavy. It's, it's heavy. You know, like the song, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. It's heavy. And it is heavy because God's glory literally means heavy and weight, a weight it's heavy, a weight of glory. It's not as light as a feather, but it's as heavy as tons of steel. I, I will, uh, my heart is steadfast. My heart is steadfast, verse 7. When it says it a second time in the same verse, it is very important for us. God is trying to teach us something. God is trying to say something very, very special and exuberant to us. My heart is steadfast. Oh, God, my heart is steadfast. It is fixed and focused and founded upon the Lord. He goes on to say, I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises. There's that sing. Say, why do we sing in church? Why do we even have a worship team? It's to sing praises and give God glory. It helps us fix and focus our hearts. And then look at verse 8. So beautiful. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praise to you among the nations. And here's what, here's what we do at Arbor. First of all, <coughs> it says, I will give thanks among the people. We are singing and praising and worshiping and giving thanks among the people. And then it says, I will sing praises to you among the nations. With Allison going to South Africa, our church is touching and reaching out and leaving Arbor fingerprint and the glory of God's fingerprint in Africa and in all nations. And those of you that support Lottie Moon mission offering and uh, uh, our, 
those ministries, we are, are touching, reaching beyond ourselves, reaching beyond ourselves. And whether we go, we can send others. Awake, my glory, awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praise to you among the nations. I call this starting off your day with God. I call it the first two minutes. A habit that I've been doing for years is the first two minutes of each day. As soon as I, I wake up, uh, there's, there's time that I give God glory. I give God praise. I say, God, use me today. God, I'm, I'm available. Good morning, Lord. If all you say is good morning, Lord, hey, that opens up. And it's not my main time of prayer, or, but it's just to begin. I've discovered something, and at least that works for me. Probably work for you, too. If I begin my day with the Lord, I'll probably finish my day with the Lord. If I begin my day with the Lord, so it's very, very, very crucial. Uh, just the first foundational uh, type thing, two minutes. Maybe for some it's just one minute. You know, two minutes. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you among the peoples. Now, at my age, I, first thing, I just give thanks, God, for another day. Because you know what? I didn't have to wake up. <laughs> I thank God for another day, each and every day. And no matter what your age is, young, old, in between, give God thanks for each day. Because each new morning is a morning that God says, I love you. And I want to use you today and possibly even touch somebody's life. I will give thanks, verse 9, to the Lord among the people. I will sing praises among the nations. And then 10, 11, for your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Uh, this is sandwiched in with loving kindness and truth, grace and truth, grace and truth. Then it says, be exalted above the heavens, O Lord. Let your glory be above all the earth. Glory is an interesting word. Uh, it literally means to shine. When we talk about God's glory, it means God shines. It's radiant. There's, there's light. So I want to just talk about a psalm for a time of lockdown. This is a psalm that is very pertinent to our culture, our situation, and what's going on today, what's going on in the news. Good news, bad news, lying news, whatever. Uh, we're going through a time of, of national instability. So we see uncertainty. We are going to a, a time of political in, intrigue. Uh, you know, who's in charge? I'm asking for a friend. Who's the real president? I'm asking for a friend. Is it somebody? Is it an individual? Is it a committee giving bullet points and this and that? Uh, we don't really know 100% what's going on. National instability, political intrigue, but what is true, we have a psalm for a time of uncertainties, and there are certainties in this time of uncertainty. One, God is in control. Jesus is Lord. The Word of God is the inspired true Word of God, and we can bank on God's truth. So I want to take a look at, at, at David right here. Four things about uh, David being locked down vis-a-vis -vis our time of, of lockdown, our time of lockdown and things. Number one, David's locked down. He's hiding in a cave. He's, he's the fugitive. Um, there's a wanted poster on all kinds of places hung up in Jerusalem. Wanted. David, son of Jesse. Wanted. If found, bring him to King Saul. And of course, didn't say for immediate execution. Saul wanted to kill him. Out of Saul's madness and jealousy, Saul knew from the prophet that a prophet said that David is going to replace you. He's the true king, and you're just a phony baloney, good time, plastic banana, rock and roll king. David is the king after God's own heart, what the Bible says, and Saul, you're just an intruder and a phony. 
How's that for a resume? No wonder Saul went nuts. Certifiable, okay? Read the the scripture, all right? David's locked down. He's locked down. He's, He's hiding, and some of us may perhaps feel in an attitude that, uh, you know, we've lost a lot of our freedom. You've got to be careful what you say, because somebody might say you're politically incorrect. I'd rather be politically incorrect and biblically true than play politics. We see here David's locked up. He's hiding. He's in a cave. But the good news is he didn't stay there forever. It was only temporary. And perhaps the things that we're going through and some of the ugliness in our nation right now is just something temporary and God is testing us and God is giving us another chance. Woe be unto our nation if we've reached a point of no return. Our hope is God's people, our churches, God's hope. It's churches like ours all across America. The people that make a stand, they, they do the right thing. They may not have political influence. They may not have big bucks deluxe. But together as a unit, we've got power. We've got strength. Yeah, I know churches have a lobbyist. And our Southern Baptist Convention actually has a lobbyist working in Southern working in Washington, D.C., and looking out for, you know, the church's interests and and things like that. But you know what? There's a better lobbyist than that, and that's God himself. It's the Holy Spirit. He's in control. He's in control. So no matter what you see in the news this week, no matter what craziness, God is in control. David locked down, but number two, David looked up. Even in that cave, his heart is looking up and looking unto God. David looked up. He uh, looked to God because God is above our circumstances. God is above it all. And we look to him. You see, David's locked down, but David looked up, and guess what? God looked down. God knows. God knows what you're going through. God knows that tear you shed this past week. God knows the heartache. God knows the pain. God knows your disappointment. God knows. Uh, God knows. God knows. You see, God looked down. Notice here he talks about uh, in Psalm 57, 1, that uh, God's wings, God's wings, God lifts his wings and we lift our hearts unto God. We see here that David's locked down, but David looked up. God looked down, and number four, the best part is God loved down. God loved down. God loved down. Consider, consider shade and shine. These two words, shade and shine. David is protected in the shadow of God's wings and God's refuge. He's protected under those wings. And the metaphor here in the Bible is so beautiful all throughout in the Old Testament with symbolism and what they call metaphors. Uh, Great, deep, theological truths that my puny brain can't understand. But when he uses a metaphor, we can understand it and know it, and live it, and grow, and glow, and go from it. He talks about a a bird, a mother bird, taking care of the young chicklets and putting the wings over them to cover them and protect them. Moms, you know what that's all about if you raise kids. And sometimes it's not just when they're young and babies or teens or preteens. Sometimes it's when they're grown adults. God protects us and puts his wings over us like a mother hen. We have his protection. We see the shade it provides for protection and from the heat and the burn of life. But we not only see the shade, but we also see the shine, the two contrasts, especially in verse 8. 
Awake, awake, my glory. The sunrise, the shine of the sunrise. I, I love sunrises. Just to see the sunrise. Now they're not as great as some of the sunsets in Southern California and beach sunsets. Yeah, I know. But we see the shine, uh, the, the shine. The, the shade and shine bring protection and glory. What I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is two things that we need to realize. Number one, we are surrounded by God's love, and then we are surrendered to God in loving him back. Surrounded and surrendered. One of the best postures we can have before God is this. God, I surrender. If you ever watch those old World War II movies or war movies or, or the country western cowboy movies and, you know, when they get the bandit and the gun and the guy goes like this, surrender, I give up. It's profitable and wonderful when we, before God, say, God, I surrender to you. But the beauty is when we raise our hands to surrender, we also raise our hands to praise and to pivot towards the Lord God. We see shade and shine. This week, I want you to focus in your life from Psalm 57 on shade and shine. We're in his shade. Remember that cliche, made in the shade? Made in the shade? We're in the shade, but we're also in the shine. We have the glow, the glow of God's glory, protection, and glory. In wrapping this up, we can see some of these things that apply to our lives. <clears throat> First of all, David was displaced. He was in a cave. He was hiding, separated from family and friends for a while, separated from his support group or support network or whatnot. He was all alone. But was he? No. God is with him, his presence his shine, his shade. You see, David was displaced, but uh, grace was displayed. Grace was displayed in David's life from God. And then we see David's discovery, this great fugitive psalm, this great fugitive psalm. <laughs> The fugitive here was not captured by Lieutenant Gerard. This fugitive was captured by God and surrendered to God. Four big bombs in this chapter, four big thought bombs that I want to resonate and explode and let the fallout comfort our hearts and minds this week. Four thought bombs out of this psalm. Four words. Loving kindness, grace, truth, and glory. We see these all throughout this psalm. Loving kindness, grace, truth, glory. All right. Since there's one week left in baseball, and you know I'm a baseball lover, uh, one last week, and then come the playoffs and the World Series, we all know about a baseball diamond. If you ever played in a church softball league or you watch baseball or in high school, junior college, you did PE and you play softball and, 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 and all that, uh, you know, there's bases. First base, second base, third base, and the goal is to score a run at home plate. Well, I see four bases, three bases and a, and a home plate in this psalm. First Base is God's loving kindness. That's first base. You get the first base. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because of the cross and because of his loving kindness. You get to first base. First base, loving kindness. Second base is grace, living in God's grace, living under God's grace. Uh, even though it seems the circumstances around the us and sometimes seem to be crushing us, we, we don't live under the circumstances. We live in grace above the circumstances. Second base is grace. Third base is truth. Third base is, is truth. Loving kindness, grace, truth. And then 
the last one, of course, the main one is glory. Glory, the shine, the glory of God in our life, and we re reflect God's glory. Glory is home plate, and that's the goal. And when I say home plate, I'm not necessarily just saying when you die and go home to be with the Lord and there's that full glory. I'm talking about here in this world, living that spiritual home plate life, scoring for God. I don't know if this was football season, I'd find a way to put in a touchdown and gain yards and, and first down, but it's baseball season with one week left to go. Hot pennant race in the National League West, Giants and, and Dodgers. And I know I, I live in L.A. Angel and Dodger territory. Don't get mad at me. Don't walk out. I have a confession. San Francisco Giants guy. Of course, I grew up in San Jose. That's where I went to see the Giants game as a boy. Those were my, my heroes and things. Well, getting, getting back to here, the home plate, the bases, the bases of God. First base, loving kindness. Second base, his grace. Third base, truth. But home plate, scoring, winning is his glory. And we don't have to wait to get to heaven to have God's glory in our lives. We can have it now. It's not the fullness of it. It's partial. We have God's glory in our lives. I want to challenge you this morning to run the bay paths and the diamond of God's glory his loving kindness, grace, and, and truth. And like David, like David, you might feel locked down. You might feel there, there's something holding back uh, and things. Do what David did. When he was locked down, he looked up because God can see through the cave because God looked down. And then God loved down. God loved down. God knows, God does. I challenge you this week to live in the shade and the shine, the shade and the shine of Psalm 57. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you'll speak to our hearts from this message and let our lives shine and be in your shade. We thank you, we thank you that no matter what lockdown government or a governor or a mayor or what lord we're free we're free in you and lord let us be a testimony and a witness unto you in all the craziness round about us lord we pray god that this will soon come to pass and we thank you we thank you for all that you do i pray in jesus name amen amen I'm gonna ask greg to come and lead us in an exit song after service, if you want to talk to me about your soul, about your eternal destiny, uh, I'm available to talk to you and share with you the good news of Jesus Christ. I think we're all home folks here, so uh, I'm not going to ask anybody that's already a member to join the church or anything else, but we just want to give God praise and glory in this lockdown. Just look up. Greg. Whether you make a decision right here and now about what God wants to do with your life or whether you walk out that door with this thought on your mind, but take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to me. Sing, Here am I. Here am I, send me, Lord. Here am I, send me, Lord. Make my life useful to me. Here am I, send me, Lord. Here am I, send me, Lord. Make my life useful to thee. God bless.
bless. Have a great week. Go out and serve God.